Okay. Next, next, let's talk about an example from grassland restoration. It's one of my favorite paintings. This is a painting up in a uh, museum up in um, San Francisco. This is a Bierstadt. This is the um, you know, sort of classic example of landscape painting in the 1800s that, that was so powerful and evocative of the, especially the Western US um, that, that uh, helped argue for things like the Grand Canyon, et cetera. But uh, I want to point out, this is a, a Bierstadt from 1875. It's called California Spring. And uh, other than being a cool painting and all this and that, tell me about the grassland. What, is it, what does it look like to you guys? Lots of flowers. Cows. That makes sense. It makes sense? Well, it doesn't make sense because if you have all that agriculture, how is that flower growth surviving? Yeah, with the cows. Okay, again, a comment about the flowers. Anything else you guys are going to say? <laughs> so, this is actually, from what we know now, that's actually pretty accurate. Has anybody been to the Anzaborego Desert in spring when we've had a good rain? Wildflowers, poppies, boom, 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 as far as you can see. So the first thing to say is when I say grassland, we think of grass land. Grasses are a key part of that, but what we might call forbs, the broad-leafed plants, are even more abundant or more important than the grasses oftentimes. So here we see all these flowers and we think, oh, that doesn't look like a grassland. That's the way the grasslands were. That we had a grass interspersed with a poppy, interspersed with a lupin, interspersed with a whatever tar plant, then another grass, etc. cetera. What you, you, your view of grasslands are tainted, gesundheit, by a century and a half of invasion and a century and a half of altered dynamics. So this is what we think of. We think of this is what I think of. I think of California's grasslands, right? So much so that we talk about the golden state. Some people think the gold refers to the, the hills, and our hills are gold much of the year. But that wasn't. If we'd been here 300 years ago, that wouldn't look like home to a lot of the native peoples. Most of the biomass we're seeing in this picture, that's either. Uh, brown or browning is from a species that up until a few, up until 150 years or so ago was living in Europe or was living in Asia and had not arrived here. So this is a classic case of doing a restoration where one of the first steps is you got to deal with the invasive species. Right? If we're trying to restore our traditional native grasslands, we need to deal with this component. So uh, I think I've showed you this before, but just to, to reiterate, um, very hard, very, 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 very hard to get an estimate of historic grasslands. I spent months and months trying to figure this out. Um, long story short is California-wide, we seem to have lost about a third of the grassland extent that we historically had. And since this, these experiments are done up at, at my Stanford uh, University site, um, it, I was looking at the area of the, any county that touches the San Francisco Bay. So for those counties, we've lost about two-thirds of the grassland extent. If we talk about grasses that have a relatively, not dominated, but just a relatively high proportion of native species, native grasses, et cetera, um, we've lost 93% of the historic uh, range in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, so that's the that's the position that we're we've been we're in. That's, that's those are the cards we've been dealt. So really, now from from an operational perspective, from a restoration perspective, like you and I might bring to it, um, the grassland. My grassland bot botanical nerd friends would freak out if I put this up. Right, there's like 36 different types of grasslands, and you know everything. <laughs> really, for most intents and purposes. We can talk about three gross, three large types of grasslands. If we added a fourth in there, it would be coastal prairie, but, but we'll leave that aside for now. So it's basically annual grass grasslands, which again are primarily non native species dominated. And then the other two would be uh, 
uh, native dominated. One on the right would be being dominated by perennial grasses, in this case bunch grasses, um, the cella pulchra, people now call stipa pulchra, but, but it's this purple needle grass on the right. Very long-lived individuals. We've had some individuals tagged now. I gotta, should update my numbers, I don't remember, but, but um, we probably have some guys tagged now for about 50 years, that so we've had an individual clump growing for at least 50 years. When you run the numbers as to how big some are and et cetera, and, and how big the guys are now, the growth rates, you, we get estimates of something like an individual clump of this grass, an individual, might be maybe 400 years old. So these are potentially long-lived systems that they get grazed a lot, they might get nubbed down, but there's a huge subsurface root mass and that bounces back. Perennial, they live from year to year to year. The annual grasslands, they, the seeds germinate, grow, um, set new seeds and die all in one season or one year. And then the third type over on the left, serpentine grassland, that's probably, you know, just by, by first pass, that's our best model for what California's uh, native grasses, native grasslands look like. Serpentine soil, named after the serpentine rock, which is this greenish rock that has a lot of funky stuff, asbestos and heavy metals and stuff in it, and is a hard place to live, really toxic for a lot of plants. Because it's so toxic, many of our native species have varieties and, and some species are specifically adapted to only live on that challenging soil. It also is really dry. Even if the rest of the area is wet, it's really dry. It doesn't hold moisture very long. So it's a tough place. Uh, it doesn't hold nutrients very easily. It's a tough place to live. So as a consequence, it's been one of the places where our natives have held out the longest. And if you look up there, that's one of my sites. Uh, where is that? can't remember the park. But it's this park uh, about halfway to my house in the Stanford campus when I used to work there. Uh, anyway, um, so this is, uh, but what you're looking at in the springtime, look at all those flowers, right? So again, there's, you can clearly see grass there, right, the green grass, but they're interspersed by all these broad-leafed flowers and, and uh, pea family plants and all kinds of good stuff like that. Okay, so three, three grassland types, annual, perennial, serpentine. Serpentine and perennial, the native dominated grasslands. I'll also say, since there's a lot of talk these days about, about Cal Exit and horrible things like that, um, <laughs> let's have a look at how important our grasslands were to us in California. So here's our state flag. And what's changed most on this flag? No right, so our last grizzly bear went extinct in the 19, well, last one was gone in 1930s, 1932. He stuffed, you can go see him in the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco if you want to see our last. Uh, grizzly bear from California. So yes, of course, of course, we drove those guys. We had grizzly bears right here on campus, right? So think of how much different it'd be to go out and get water if maybe that dude is walking around the <laughs> corner, right? So um, this guy kicked everybody's butt, kicked the mountain lion's butt, kicked everybody's butt. This was the apex terrestrial predator. Eat plants if you wanted to eat plants. Eat fish if you wanted to eat fish. Eat dead whale carcasses if you wanted to eat dead whale carcasses. Eat whatever, right? Eat you wanted to. So, uh, right, and that's what everybody says, and that's, that's a, the natural thing. What I see this, because I'm a nerd, what I do is I look underneath the bear. What's that? Grass, grass. grass and? It looks like poop. <laughs> <laughs> it's not poop. Weeds? Footprints? Not footprints. Ground squirrel burrows. <laughs> when we think when we think of grasslands, we think of plants. Grasslands have a whole association of critters with them. Indeed, it was dangerous for a lot of the early explorers to, to ride horses in California. One, because we had so many wetlands in the Central Valley, it was marshy and swampy, hard to do that. But two, you snap your neck all the time because the grasslands are full of potholes and the horses would stumble all the time, you know, walk and then either put their hoof into a burrow or step and then the ground collapse. So dangerous. Ground squirrels, California ground squirrels, fundamentally important part of these grasslands. A whole, grasslands aren't just the plants, they're the plant and animal matrix and, and community. 
So in a healthy functioning grassland, we have butterflies and all this other stuff that's associated with them, even though we seem to always focus on just the plant tissue part of the calculation. So ground squirrels are a key part of California, and that is one of the other massive things that's changed so much from when we established the Bear Republic, which only lasted for five days. Um, uh, yeah, right, you guys get what I'm saying. Okay, so here we go. That's, so uh, again, also I should have said, also by way of introduction, that gra those grasses introduced with the Spanish missionaries, right? Introduced, and originally the epicenter of the invasion were the missions. They, they're the ones that bring in cattle, goats, sheep. And so they, bring, they intentionally bring over a lot of these seeds. Lolium, Avena, these, these genera of grasses, so they could plant them because that's what the European cows like to eat, European grasses. We also bring over things like brassica or mustard plants because when the cows don't feel good, you feed them some of this mustard and it makes them feel better. So intentionally brought over species, took over our grasslands, unintentional uh, uh, things came as well. I think I'm gonna run out of, yeah. Okay, so let me, let me just finish a little bit about grasslands just by way of background, because I don't know if you guys have this yet. So initially, California dominated by bunch grasses and forbs and things like that. <coughs> we bring over these, the, these non-native ungulates and they're mostly restricted initially to the area of human development, to the area around the missions. Right, the last mission built, do you guys know what, what was the last mission built by Father Sarah? Ventura, that's right. The Ventura, San Buena Ventura mission was the last of, the, of, the, of his original missions that were built. So, so um, that's a little trivia for you. You can do that at Thanksgiving dinner when you're trying to not talk about politics or something. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so, so we, ha we have all this stuff. N now, then all of a sudden what happens? What year do we discover gold? Eighteen, good. I've got the eighteen part. Forty-eight. People start coming in forty-nine. So San Francisco forty-niners. That's how you can remember, right? San Francisco forty-niners discover gold the year before, and then people start coming, and then they start coming, and then they keep coming, and then they keep coming, and there's massive flush of European immigrants or or people of European descent emigrating into California, right? One of the things that those folks oftentimes they're not outdoor people. So they start, firstly, almost nobody finds gold, right? No surprise. The people, who are the people that make money? Stanford, Levi Strauss, those folks that sell stuff to the miners. Those are the folks that really get rich. Anywho, they, um, they realize that these guys just show up, literally just show up sometimes with nothing on their back. Okay, I'm gonna go get rich. Walk in, they think they're gonna walk in the hills and suddenly strike a rich. They're not prepared. So one of the first things they start doing is realizing they're going to, they're going to, they're going to be starving, <clears throat> starving to death. So they start shooting everything. So they shoot tule elk, they shoot deer, they whatever they can get. And pretty soon this massive explosion in population in California is starting to strip the, um, the wild populations of abundant organisms. Then in the 1860s, we hit this drought, which was the last massive drought we had before the one we appear to be entering is still in now. That was crazy. So across the whole state, massive, massive decrease in rainfall. All of the vegetation communities, from what we can tell, are stressed. Trees are dying, uh, uh, grass is drying up. And so a lot of these folks had just decided they were gonna get rich by having a lot of cattle farm, sheep farm, that kind of stuff. Uh, throughout the state, and so they brought in all these giant heads of cattle, etc. And now everything's dying, so much so that these guys, many of them, just end up turning their their animals loose because it wasn't even cost effective to kill them. Everything's dying. Everything's dying. Everything's dying. So now you have these these packs of packs. <laughs> Jeez, what am I? Uh, I do a PhD in biology, surprisingly. Uh, these herds of cattle 
roaming around, everything is getting nubbed down to the bottom. Everything is getting nubbed. Trees are being grazed. The vegetation is being nubbed down to the, to the bare ground. Mm -hmm. The difference is now we have all, in these epicenters of invasion, we have all these non-native sources of seed, right? The natives, whoop, here's my seed. I'm going to land right here. And then, oh, is it rainy? I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Oh, yeah, I guess maybe I'll start growing now. Okay, I'll start growing. Grow a little bit now, right? If a plant's 400 years old, it doesn't have to do as do in two months, right? However, the annuals do have to do their due in one month. So when the, when the um, drought ends, we have all of these in nucleating invasion centers across the state. And, and the perennial bunch grass is one of the ways they, def they successfully compete is they're like a big fro, a big afro, whoosh, a big shrub, right? And they're physically occupying the space around them with their own tissue. But now, recall, they have all been nubbed down to nothing. So at least the surface tissue, they're, they're basically non-existent. So that one key competitive advantage is deleted. And now we have all the rains return, all of a sudden the annuals start to go. And so that really, this drought and this massive overgrazing that happens really seems to have been the key shifting point that started to push us towards this now non-native dominated grassland. Okay? So that was the last little bit of grassland history for you guys. Okay. So let's talk about what we did up there. So again, here the challenges are we have some endangered species, things like the tiger salamander and stuff that we've already talked about. But then... Primarily invasive species, things that, we, that are not native that we don't want in our uh, ultimately successful grassland, or at least we want to minimize them. Key metrics we were using were soil seed banks, so, so what's the propagule pressure like, one. And then two, how quickly these, these seeds turn into um, uh, plants, or, or the recruitment rate. Again, we're going to take a phased approach to restoration. We're going to expand over spatial and temporal scales, as we said. Um, not so much for our class, but just so you guys understand, this was also part of an HCP. Does anybody remember what HCP is from conservation biology? It stands for Habitat Conservation Plan. This is essentially an agreement to do things uh, not on a species-by-species -species basis, but on more of a community basis. So that we're not constantly being driven by individual endangered species concerns, but we're trying to recover the entire system. You guys can ask me more about that if you want later, but, uh, but this, this played into some of our HCP discussions for Stanford University campus. Okay, again, recall this is going to be in the dish area. Here's the 280. Here's the main part of campus. Here's, here's where that uh, uh, Lagunit Lake Lagunita is, and this is where we're going to do our conversations here. Reference sites. Do we have any healthy grasslands on the main Stanford campus? No. They're almost all, well, there's some at one site, but, but by and large, no. So we have to look towards other locations for what we might consider guides to tell us how we should do our, our uh, restoration. And that's what I'm showing you here. So each of these green things is a potential, uh, so actually not potential, it's actually sites that I measured, but, but a reference site. Okay. Let's talk about the proportion of native cover. Here's, a, here's one, one approach that you can take to using reference sites to determine what is success or not. So here on the left, I'm showing you the proportion of native cover in our grassland. And uh, reference sites are there. Now, the, the reference sites are just the reference sites. I mean, the, I initially just put it, did, didn't, didn't pick them because of necessarily one specific reason or not. Just they seem to be a potential reference site for any of any reason or another. I've colored them here so that our annual grassland sites are the brown diamond, the bunch grass sites are the green square, and the serpentine sites are the yellow triangle. Recall that the uh, serpentine and the bunch grass sites will be do or a higher proportion of natives than uh, our traditional annual grassland site. And so all I've done is I've used the data to make these colored blocks. So one thing, we can use reference sites to say success or not, or we can use them to help us on our trajectory of recovery. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm using the, 
the values from our reference sites to tell us what what is considered a success or not. Also, taking the understanding that, hey, it's unrealistic to think that a system that's been hammered for 150 years is going to be better overnight. So we're using this sort of longer term view. So uh, if we get a restoration that is, say, less than about 17% native cover, that seems to be a failure. We'll call that a failure, right? If it's between that and say about 55 percent, maybe that's maybe that's getting good. It's not it's not ideal yet, but maybe it's on the right traje trajectory. Maybe if we were hitting that in the first couple of years, that would be a good thing. And then you know uh, uh, after that, increased proportion. The best of the best sites that we see up there. Check it out. The best of the best is about 68 percent native cover. So saying that we want 100% cover, that's probably unrealistic, right? I can't find a place in nature uh, outside of, you know, a one meter by one meter square plot or something like that, that any outside of any size that actually has 100% native cover. So in some cases, like our California grasslands, it might be unrealistic to think we will ever eliminate the invaders. Cool? All right, so there's that. Here's some of my experiments. So uh, we'll talk about these in a second, but just to give you a sense, here are some of my experiments. Um, we're going to talk about the tarping experiment first, but check it out. Uh, not really, and you don't know what these are yet, but these are just restorations. So th this, this, this flavor of restoration, that sucked. This flavor of restoration, not so good. This flavor, eh, may, it seems to kind of be getting you know, better, right? Uh, same thing. This one sucked. This one sucked. This one's better. Whoa, that one's way better. Right? So by using this phased approach and do, taking an experimental approach to restoration, we can figure out for our particular site, with our particular conditions, what's the best response. Maybe the best response in coastal California is not going to be the best response on the eastern side of the Sierras. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But, but this approach allows us to know for sure. Right or with a not maybe not for sure, but a, with a much greater confidence. Okay, so again, let's let's orient us. Here's this big road. We talked about the salamander ponds. That that stuff was over here. Here's Lake Laganita, and we're bounded. This area is bounded by these different roads. Okay, so our first experiment was an area that was damaged not by us but by the some construction activity. So here we go. So we started off. Here is uh, bare ground. Here is native seed mix that we've made, and we're, we, you know, we're gonna. This Jeff is sprinkling this here over the ground, and then afterwards we're gonna come in and straw it with a process that you guys uh, already heard about. Except in this case, we're we're hand strawing it. We weren't we weren't uh, hydro seeding it or hydro blowing it, but you guys get the idea. Okay, so here's the first experiment I want to talk about. Um, there, there's a large experiment which is the multicolors, but I want to want to focus today on the tarping experiment, small scale experiment. And that's the different colors. So there's a black which represents a manipulation and a pink which represents a control. And notice these things are paired, they're side by side. So some of them are on a little bit more of an angle, some of them are a little more flat, but they're always paired. So we always have a fair comparison or fair thing to measure performance with. Okay, so here's the question. We have a lot of non-natives in the seed bank. How can we tip the balance to the natives? And so uh, there's a couple questions. And in this case, I'm showing you the question that the basic scientist might ask and the other that the applied scientist might ask. So the restorationist might ask QA. The university professor might ask QB, but they're, they're very similar and related. The, one, the first one is, is the seed supply or neighbors drive the composition? In other words, does having a lot of seeds in the seed bank matter? Or does having not a lot of bad guys competing with you, uh, adults, matter? And then I'm going to try to mess with the soil with a barrier. And that's what the QA is going to be about. So what I did was I did tarping. I put, in a, put a barrier down on the surface of the dirt. And I either put a tarp on or didn't put a tarp on. 
and I either added seeds or I didn't add seeds. And the metrics were seed banks and native cover. Okay, that's what I, that's what I mean. This is what it looks like underneath my tarp. So these were not pure solid pieces of plastic that you might think of. This wasn't like a trash bag piece of plastic. This was much more like a really heavy, 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 heavy duty shade cloth. This is the stuff they use if you guys have been at batting cages. This is kind of stuff they might put in the back of batting cages, that kind of stuff. So um, I stretch these out, put these down. But here I put my camera underneath the, underneath the tarp and took a picture. And you can see that light does get through, right? It's, this isn't pitch black. This isn't totally dark. It's just, it's just dark. It's, it's just shaded. This is actually a temperature probe on the surface. And this is a temperature probe I have buried in the soil to measure what it was doing to the temperature. OK, so we put these down. Put these down in uh, September and pulled them up right around uh, Halloween. So you saw us spreading the seeds around. So we had different experimental treatments for that, which is, around, which is the area around here. But I'm not, I'm not talking about that right now. We're really focusing on this area. So this, the tarps have been down. And now this is my assistant, Jenny. She's now at Louisiana State University. Uh, Jeff is a professor uh, up at, um, what the hell is this? De Anza? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, professor of the Bay Area. <laughs> so, uh, so these guys are, are, are um, back when they were my grunts, uh, they um, were pulling up. So they're pulling up the tarp. Now the tarp's been here for a while, like I said, a few weeks. And they're pulling it up. And this is what it looks like underneath. All this stuff. Those are ateliated germlings. So those are plants that have started to grow, right? So, the, so they've germinated, they've sent out their cotyledons, their cotyledons have turned into stems and leaves, and they're growing. But do they look like normal plants? What do they look like? Oh, um, they might look like non-natives, right? But in general, just morphologically, what do they look like? They look normal to you? No, lacking Well, tell me what they look like first. Okay. Okay. Good. So they're white, yeah. not very green, and they're what? Yeah. So 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 they're they're super long, right? What that's telling you is these plants are looking for light. These plants think they're underground. These plants are growing as fast as they can because they think they're still in dirt. So they're getting long, 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 hoping that tomorrow they're going to break through the soil surface and get to the sun. And then they can start photosynthesizing and doing everything. So the little bit of light that comes through is enough for them to say, hey, you should start growing. The tarp actually boosted the relative humidity. So the tarps actually made it slightly wetter than it would be for slightly longer parts of the day. So it made it seem wetter. Now, the native guys weren't tricked. The native perennials are like, dude, I'm chilling until I get some kick butt rain, <laughs> right? The annuals, whose whole ecology is based on germinate as quickly as you can, grow as fast as you can, they're tricked. They think this little bit of humidity means that it's about to rain, you know, dump buckets and buckets of rain on them. So they, they're the ones that germinated by and large. So now we pull the tarp off. Now, what do you think is going to happen to these plants now that we pulled the tarp off? Right, so they're going to dry out, one, two, they're going to get sunburnt and die. Because mm -hmm. not only do they not have their, their, their chlorophyll, their, their photosynthesizing pigments, that chlorophyll also absorbs the uh, electromagnetic energy, right? So not having that means that we're going to have a lot more UV penetrating the rest of their system. They're basically going to get sunburnt and die. So we pull the tarp off and these guys die. And this is what it looks like after, after a few more... Uh, after a few more months. So surrounding the area was the, was the part that wasn't treated. So that's sort of the background seeds that came up and, and whatever we tossed in. But then if you look in here, maybe you guys can see this. Here's one of my plots right here. Here's another plot right here. Here's another plot right here. Here's another plot. You can actually see the plots without needing anything fancy. Here's what it looks like quantitatively. 
this graph, species richness. Now these are our little seed, if you guys have done seed cores with me, these are little seed cores, these little uh, soup cans that we jam in the ground and just take out, take out the soil. So this is um, relatively low richness, agreed, but this is because we're sampling such a small area. So this is species richness in the seed bank. So we take the soil right there, take them back into the greenhouse, germinate the guys in the greenhouse, and then that's how we look at what's in the seed bank. And this is density. This is the number of seeds per, per unit area. And it's, just, and it's uh, so what we see here is natives, right, is in the orange, exotics in the brown color. And what we see is um, uh, without the tarp, check it out, we have, we have some natives, but the exotics are about twice as many uh, species of exotics as natives. That's bad, right? Where we've tarped, they're actually not significantly different, but they're actually slightly lower, right? So, so we've eliminated, we've harmed some of the competitive advantage of the exotics. If you look at the number of these guys, um, without the tarp, we have our um, natives, natives, but with the tarp, so, so in other words, the natives aren't harmed by the tarp. The exotics are greatly harmed by the tarp. And then if we look later on in subsequent uh, times of the year, uh, when growth will be going, here's the tarp, yellow is the tarp, brown is no tarp. And this is where we didn't add any natives to the seed bank. This is where we added our native mix. So clearly where we added our native mix, there's, there's more, you know, relative to the none, there's, there's more uh, native plant tissue growing over the plot. But check it out. It's, it, it, the tarping disproportionately benefits the natives and it disproportionately harms the exotics. You guys with me? Everybody cool? So it turns out that a diverse seed bank really does imp improve plant cover. And uh, as a subsequent, the, the, the seed bank in, in one time of the year will help, you know, six months later, the plant cover. Uh, the tarping harms the exotics more so than harming the natives. It doesn't seem to harm the natives at all, but, but if it does even slightly, it really harms the exotics. And this tells us that natives are limited by both recruitment and post-recruitment interactions. Okay, let's look at another version. So now can we, can we take that? Those were relatively small, right? You guys saw how big that was. That was about three meters by three meters or so in a plot. That was cool, but that was expensive. Can we push this into a, a scale that's more applicable over a larger area? So the, 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 the feedback we always get from these small scale experiments is the, is the restoration practitioners say, oh yeah, uh-huh, okay, well, sure. If I was a professor and didn't have anything to do, everything's safe, I have nothing to do. Didn't have anything to do and had the summers off, everything's got the summers off. Then, of course, I could make my little garden be great, you know. But we work in the real world, right? That's what we always hear. So the question is, can we take that approach, that, that approach, say, of tarping to try to bet, shift the native exotic abundance, can we take that from the sort of scale of a few square meters to hundreds of square meters to hectares? If we can... Or, or, or if we try this, we want to look at the efficacy. Is it still working as well? One. Two, logistics get hard. Can we actually do it at that scale? And if we can, the stuff I'm going to propose to you, it's going to go from the stuff that I did was 37 cents a square foot, which is expensive, to, uh, I mean, potentially a lot cheaper, but the stuff that we used, uh, about uh, four one-hundredths of a cent per square foot. So orders of magnitude cheaper if we can do it at the larger scales with this other material that's not as ideal. So this is what we did. So here is a scene uh, from uh, our management. This is a different site. This is still at Stanford. This is a slightly different site though. This is a brassica. This is a, a non-native um, mustard invasion. So you can see this stuff. See, it's just starting to grow. And as we talked about out at Ojai Meadows, right, the ideal time is just when these guys are starting to flower because they put all this energy in, right? We're not waiting, we're not cutting them down when they're one inch off the ground. We're letting them spend a lot of their energy, right? 
let them, let them build all that tissue, build all that structure, consume all those energy reserves in their tubers or roots or whatever. And then just before they go to the reproductive phase, whack them. That's the ideal time to whack them. And you might have to whack them a couple times. So that's what's going on here. So here we go, boo, 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 boo. The, the, in this case, the, the tall mustard is starting to grow and we've come in and we've mowed it. Here's, here's the first pass with the mower just so you can get a sense of scale. And then we've mowed the whole thing down so it's, it's dead and we've come through and mowed it a couple more times. And then we've tarped it. So these were using these blue tarps, kind of get at Home Depot, the kind you see on the roofs at, at, uh, after hurricanes and stuff come through. So blue tarps, much cheaper material much lower quality construction. This is my uh, technician, Paolo, who's now a professor, I think, in Switzerland or somewhere in, in, um, somewhere in Central Europe. Um, and he is, uh, so, we're, 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 so this is non-trivial, <laughs> getting these things to tie down, right? These are huge tarps, these are like a sail, and, uh, and they like to blow, and um, it was a problem. So we did the first experiment. first experiment didn't really work. Turns out one of these things wasn't that thick. And so it didn't really make the plants be ateliated. They germinated, but they were green instead of being white and long. So then we, just, we had to redo the experiment. So we redo the experiment the next year. And we did two layers, I don't know if you can tell us, two layers of plastic. And we thought, OK, great. And then we found out that some frats screwed with us. So some fraternities had come up in the middle of the night and taken off our, our sandbags and took one of the tarp layers out and then very precisely put the, tarp, put the sandbags back so we couldn't tell. And they were doing these crazy uh, water slides uh, oh. parties oh. with our tarps. I know, bastards. bastards. <laughs> so then we had to do it again. So there, there are a lot of problems as we kept having problems. But, but the short version is um, when we actually were able to get, you know, doubled up the tarps, we actually saw the kind of suppression we were looking for. Oh, I guess I'm done. I guess I don't have another problem. Okay, so anyway, so, um, so the answer is this does seem to work, but you have to do it precisely. You can't just put a tarp down today and think it's gonna work. You have to time, you have to put it down at the end of summer, keep it on there just into the early fall. If you leave it too late, the plants will, will figure it out and they'll start laying down different kinds of chlorophyll and stuff. So, so it's a timing thing. But actually, if you do it right, it will work and it will harm the exotics disproportionately.